Hello, everyone. Very nice to, to, to greet you all. I'm going to start. Guyen, I think, could you please? Okay, thank you. I was getting a bit of external sound. Uh, nothing. Uh, good afternoon, good morning to, to all of you. Um, uh, Guyen and myself are going to do a very brief presentation around uh, the project of Inteligencias Colectivas Cuba. And then we will move on forward with the program of the day. Before we get started, I would really like to thank uh, Peter Fisher and Guille de Jesus for helping setting up both, uh, both technological epicenters in Havana and in Berlin. So thank you very much for that. Nothing very happy as well to get started with this second phase of Inteligencias Colectivas Cuba. It's a, Inteligencias Colectivas is a platform that for over 10 years has been investigating the informal development of, of territories. Over these years, we have worked in around 20 countries and many more communities. And it sort of works as a broad umbrella under the which we explore different developments through topics such as the relationships with materials and technologies, ad hoc solutions, tensions between old practices and contemporary ones, and their subsequent fusions, and of course the human network behind these endeavors. We mainly look at non-standardized, many times marginal practices at different levels and scales within territories. I think in summary, although Juanito will develop, will share a bit more later, we could say that Inteligencias Colectivas explores like material and immaterial patrimony of communities around the fields of urbanism, design, crafts, and architecture. Uh, the platform is flexible, collaborative platform, and one of the most important, I think, aspects of its methodology is that when it lands in a different territory, it necessarily always integrates and each project is imagined with local counterparts, which are looking at the at different areas we or topics we may be covering this this alliance is fundamental for the project because even though we're working under a very broad umbrella it's very it's uh, it's fundamental to integrate the uh, specific subjectivities of each place the local idiosyncrasies and at the same time to to be able to get the proper point of view when when addre when addressing a specific uh, Territory. So, so uh, with in the in the case of Inteligencias Colectivas Cuba, we have been with an ongoing dialogue around the project for about now three years. It all started in a trip, like uh, yeah, three years ago when we were investigating around. Um, it was an artistic investigation around barber shops as social condensers of broader realities of that of the of Havana in this case. And in this investigation, we were already touching topics that overlap with the scope of Inteligencias Colectivas, like we were looking at the use of spaces, the jurisdiction around their functionality, habitability, recycling as a form of necessity, maintenance, uh, and the different relationships with materials in a place like Cuba. It was in this trip when we met with, with Guyen, and uh, from conversations, we had an automatic realignment of the places we were looking at in this uh, in the in this direction. And well, when we left the trip, we both parts we were very eager to start uh, to start developing this project, and we started a continuous dialogue, which was since which was since been taking form. Particular Cuba, I was I was even though I'm from Madrid, I was raised most of my life in in Havana. Cuba as an island has a history that uh, that has provided it with a very singular development as a, as a place. First, because of its geographic condition as an island and its location in the middle of the Caribbean, Cuba played a, a very particular role in the whole Atlantic trade and colonial and colonial schemes. And it was sort of like the the node as a, of the no, the node uh, the node of the Spanish colonial scheme. And so a lot of transit was coming from all the Americas and all Cuba and Africa into there. So it sort of became like a, a meeting a meeting point of exchange. Then apart from this geographical geographical condition that has shaped its its history, its more recent political history has also shaped a lot its 
its development, with its alignment with the Soviet Union and the material exchanges and cultural that came from that, but also because of the of the American embargo being only 90 miles away from the United States, the um, the is and having a whole material embargo for close to 60 years now. This has uh, this has uh, made accessibility for materials, technology, and different very different than than other places. And without exo exoticizing it, it has inevitably constructed like an urban landscape with very unique structures and very singular relationships at all levels. This is why when speaking with Guyen, we envisioned this as a large scale project at, at a, and a medium to long term project because of the so much the layers that. Uh, that it has to be to be studied. Like, um, so we were meant to go to Cuba the past October to conduct this phase two and develop a workshop with uh, with students there, but this uh, pandemic impeded it, and uh, we're just postponing the trip to March. And while everything has been lagged, this situation has also opened up what we all think. I think it's been a very positive op opportunity in the sense that by creating this virtual workspace, where in the coming months. We'll be holding other symposiums with more content, perhaps less than this one, which is more internal. And so we're all familiar with ourselves. We will be hosting three symposiums and be producing a lot of content online, uh, online uh, both written content, video, maps, and stuff. So I think this virtual space suddenly has derived into a situation that already favors this exchange between the different universities, the different organizations, and and parts and so overall I think that the intelligencias colectivas Cuba is like it's six different things which is at an educational pedagogical level it's a project that uh, that wants to engage universities students and professorships through workshops lectures study programs and producing content which the, which which can be exchanged at the same time, it does seek to integrate in formal education's environment these different points of views of what local patrimony can be and how patrimony is being uh, being created today. These academic professional exchanges as well between people from from Cuba and the and the European Union and and also different parts around are, are getting incorporated. Just were at the beginning. And at the same time, the project also has like an autonomous investigation that feeds the lines that we have uh, investigated by Inteligencias Colectivas historically. And of course, it seeks out, apart from this, it's a more registration of people, of elements, of studies. It also seeks to give out practical results in the coming phases, things like uh, more developed cartographies, constructing prototypes, and uh, and yeah, and uh, more workshops between students uh, of Cuba, but also of the different uh, of the different uh, universities involved. So this is a bit of general pictures. So I've tried to be the most brief possible, but I think now I'll pass the word on to Guyen, who I think can develop more from their point of view what the project signifies. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you all. Welcome. Good morning to people who is here in the embassy and also the student and professor Casanave in the University Technological of Havana. Also, uh, good afternoon, everyone in Berlin who is watching us. It's an honor for me and Lorenzo to start this event that we've been preparing for the last two years and in the very specific context. The city of Havana was celebrating the last November 501st anniversary. So this is a great contest to think about the future of the city from inside the city. A city that has to live with emergency condition that is assumed to the difference vulnerability in the dude in the geographical position. A city that has been dealing with the renovation of the historical center for now most of 30 years. In policy today that we're thinking urban transportation and aspire to resilient strategies against environmental but also economic vulnerability. The city is in the process of thinking of the future for the future, which is also a continuous object of a study by professional academics and students from Wittings in the island, the island and abroad. During the last century, but most specifically in the last decade, as a result of the social and economic situation, Cubans have developed an incredible intelligence to adapt different devices and create amazing construction techniques. This process does not come from technical knowledge or from professional field. It comes from people wisdom, the need to reuse and also from the passing of knowledge from generation to, gen to generation. But sometimes we use these unique designs in our city, but we don't understand their full potential. 
these ideas of using, recycling, adapting, creating new networks to obtain information on entertainment and the use of local material are in sexual heritage that we must study and protect. Personally, it is important to look at the city and that process with respect. It is a potential it's a potential tool to find a catalog of multiple solutions that allows you to think about local solutions. It is also important to bring that knowledge, story, to value. Today, we present the second phase of the Inteligencia Colectiva, Inteligencia Colectiva Cuba in an exceptional condition. Um, the current health situation put us all at the point where we, had, where we had to rethink how to go ahead with the project and made us adapt to this new situation but it has also created other opportunities and new ways to connect. Today, we are connected from different countries, three different universities, cultural institutions, art and architectural work groups, academics, students, teachers, architects, artists, sociologists, and other fields of research and work. Inteligencia Colectiva Cuba was born two years ago as a result of a trip by the IC team to Cuba and from then to recognize in the city an enormous potential for innovation. Two years after the meeting in Havana, we are very happy to start in the second phase of IC Cuba and see how many colleagues join to us. I want to thank very spe uh, very special way Peter Fisher of the TU, Guille de Jesus and David in the Cuba who is helping us with all the connection. So, I think the, this is welcome to the Inteligencia Colectiva phase two. I think, sorry, I think uh, now we, I don't know if he has arrived finally, uh, Jorge Peralta from the Spanish Embassy wanted to wanted to to say some opening, some welcome words. Yeah. Uh, no, we have a change, so Jorge is not here yet, so I want to introduce uh, Raquel from the CLIC project. She's here next to me. Sorry. Good morning, everybody in Havana, and good afternoon, everyone in, in Europe. And thank you very much, Lorenzo, Aguillén, uh, and all the participants of the Inteligencias Colectivas project for inviting the CLIC project uh, today. Uh, as partners of uh, Inteligencias Colectivas Cuba, uh, we are looking forward to, to know more uh, the advances of, of the project, and we look forward at the different uh, contributions that will be made today here. Uh, will be productive and, and enriching. Uh, I'm going to, to talk a bit uh, about uh, the CLIC project uh, to give uh, the context of uh, why we are uh, supporting uh, Inteligencias Colectivas Cuba. Uh, CLIC, the CLIC project is a cultural cooperation project uh, that uh, wants to contribute to the development of uh, creative industries and young artists, young uh, Cuban young artists through the exchange uh, with uh, with Europe. Uh, CLIC is uh, financed by the European Union. It is executed by the uh, Spanish uh, International, for, uh, International Cooperation for Development Agency. And in, in, on behalf of a group of uh, embassies uh, and cultural institutions in Havana, uh, which have created a cultural network uh, that it's called uh, Unique, uh, unique Cuba under the umbrella of a global uh, European uh, network called Unique, uh, that, that is uh, European Union National Institutes for Culture. And among uh, them, uh, the Spanish Embassy and also the uh, German Embassy, uh, whose uh, representative is uh, today also with us. And I want to thank you, uh, Michael Dos. Um, the action of uh, the project is uh, uh, thus in line with the objectives of the cultural cooperation project, uh, program of the European Union and the different embassies who participate in this uh, network in its mission of promoting uh, culture as a vector of development in Cuba. Cuba is a country with a high level of uh, artistic and cultural education where culture uh, has a uh, 
prominent place in public policy. Uh, and Cuba is also uh, now in a process of uh, updating uh, its economical economic model um, and in the, uh, cultural industries and young uh, creators uh, have a fundamental role uh, for development and social inclusion, inclusion uh, within this uh, context. Uh, uh, the CLIC project um, supports uh, the organization of uh, different type of activities, uh, educational workshops, uh, promotion, uh, cultural exchange, research and collective creation between creators and professional of the cultural sector uh, from Cuba and, and Europe. And it has uh, four uh, main working lines uh, the first one is the support to cultural industries. The second is the support to young creators who um, provide the talent and the, the fuel to these uh, cultural industries, uh, promote the insertion of um, cultural sector and Cuban creators to uh, professional networks and international markets uh, in Europe. And because of uh, the cities are uh, spaces of high concentration of uh, cultural industries and creators, the CLIC project uh, has also as a strategic line to uh, stimulate the, the research and application of uh, different uh, proposal of urban planning that are innovative, sustainable and um, inclusive. Um, this uh, working line is also very present in the, in the cooperation program of the European Union in Cuba with projects like the cultural corridor of the Linea Street. And it is also under this uh, uh, working line of the CLIC project that uh, uh, we are supporting Inteligencias Colectivas Cuba. And we hope and wait that your results will help to, to reflect on how to have a, a more uh, sustainable, resilient and inclusive uh, city of Havana. Thank you very much. And I wish uh, everybody a very productive uh, seminar today and tomorrow. I see my name on the screen. So, uh, hola a todos. Uh, here's Jacob van Rijs. I'm a professor at TU Berlin, and uh, my fachgebied, my chair, and is sort of uh, involved in this uh, project from the beginning. It was, of course, uh, mostly uh, by the connection that some of the researchers in my student, in my team, um, Robin Godard and Lorena Valdivia, has with some other. Uh, people from Soul House, for instance, and so there's all kind of connections um, from inside the city and inside Europe towards different places in the world. And um, this is for us a very exciting uh, moment where all these kind of things come together. And of course, as a, we are just combining that, let's say, the teaching in, in, our, in our classes with more research about also about construction. And um, in the past, we have been doing this in India uh, as, a, as a practice. I'm also uh, an architect and with a studio in Rotterdam. We are working on different places in the world. And uh, this combination was uh, for us interesting in, in India, where we realized the school uh, in a design and build structure. Uh, but we also noticed that it was uh, it's interesting to develop next steps uh, and not to have this sort of hit and run design and build experiences and I think especially the the, the team of uh, Intelligentes Colectivas and, and, and Zoho House have been really uh, yeah, have really interesting methodologies that we like to um, to learn from and of course together with the, the people in, in Cuba develop this uh, to, in, into a sort of more um, yeah resilient typology of um, of collaboration and uh, I think it's very interesting also for the for the students of uh, our different institutes and um, sort of the FU and the FAC and the TU Berlin to connect to each other and also to develop this sort of uh, maybe a catalog of, 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 of ideas and, and solutions um, that can be uh, yeah base for even more uh, solutions in the future so it could be a long-term development that we can initiate 
And um, yeah, so that that this um, could also be applied also even in other, in other places in the world. We have been looking at this as well. Um, so that's, yeah, but here in this uh, this special project, many things come together. And um, um, yeah, it's, it's also kind of um, a laboratory, you could say, um, where uh, everybody's adding their knowledge, their time and their, their uh, kind of enthusiasm. And together we should uh, make the yeah yeah make the best of this of this all this brain power uh, together. So uh, this is I would say the wish I have that we really can uh, develop fantastic possibilities and ideas, and that that have a meaningful future use uh, in, in in different places. Of course, we tested first in Havana, and I'm very excited to to come uh, again. To Cuba, I've been there once, but it was already, uh, I was longing for a, a next time and I'm happy to be able to come again. So thank you very much for the opportunity and I would look forward to our collaboration. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Sarah Wessel from the Berlin Center for Global Engagement at the Berlin University Alliance. So we are really very happy that we can financially contribute to the project. Um, so the let me just quickly say what we do at the Berlin Center for Global Engagement. So as I said, it's part of the Berlin University Alliance, which is basically four partners cooperating, which is the Freie University Berlin, the Technical University Berlin, Humboldt University Berlin and the Charité. And they develop different strategies, how these uh, four partners can collaborate better together. And uh, from one theme, which is a cross-cutting theme, internationalization, the Berlin Center for Global Engagement was created. And basically we have three major tasks. So it's um, uh, our working areas are to foster and support cooperation with the so-called Global South. Um, well, we are not pursue. we're a little bit critical of this expression Global South. We define it not in a regional way, we define it rather as um, uh, existing dominant hierarchies in knowledge production. This is why we also have two more working areas, which is science diplomacy and academic freedom. And within this framework, we try to support uh, various projects and, and collaborations such, uh, such as US. And one of our first activities was to make an inaugural call for projects assisting already at these four universities with their partners in other countries. Um, and we received 45 applications that were really great and we could finally fund 17 and one uh, one of yours is out of them. Um, so we were really impressed um, about the many different partners from this very different fields and areas from scientific institutions, cultural institutions and also civil initiatives that also try to, to uh, make like local knowledge more visible. Um, and we are also um, very impressed because especially now in times of um, increasing nationalist populism, um, of an increase where we have the awareness that we have to cooperate more to address global challenges, uh, this, these forms of uh, cooperation are really necessary and important, um, but still very special. And of course, it's also quite difficult in these times of a pandemic to, um, yeah, to maintain such a network. Yeah, so we're really happy that we can support a little bit, and we also hope that we can support you more and in a different way. So, as I said, we were recently established, so we are maybe half a year old, so to say, and we still have capacities to to support projects in different ways, making them more visible. Um, so we could, for example, work as an entry point for you to this uh, four universities, which you have found already, of course, right? But if you want to continue, maybe. Um, and we could also try and help to make uh, your project more visible for other partners. And we try to reach out to funding bodies and then also try to explain them what uh, funding politics could increase to foster such cooperation because they are indeed often challenging. Um, yeah, and uh, I hope that um, you have a great meeting today and I'm very interested in listening and participating. So best of luck and thank you for the invitation.
Yeah, that's my name and that of uh, colleague Vicente, whom you might know already pretty well. I have to introduce myself uh, from the very start. I am uh, heading the Disaster Research Unit at Free University in Berlin. And as such, I'm very happy to join this uh, consortia um, to contribute as far as possible with my resources. Let me just give a short background introduction to what we are usually doing in our uh, research center. We are working on the whole um, cycle of uh, crisis and disasters in all the uh, related aspects. And as such, uh, we, have, we are dealing, of course, with a very complex um, field. Um, disasters and crises occur in the everyday life, uh, but also result in widespread destruction um, in between, there are actors on multiple levels, interacting, communicating, behaving, and so on and so forth, dealing with problems which I didn't know even uh, about the existence before. So it's very situative, it's very processual, very dynamic. And as such, uh, in this field, uh, we are completely relying on the expertise of those who are professionals in the specific situation. So not necessarily by training, but rather the, uh, these uh, experts of practice, uh, if I call it that way. And this might be in one situation, those uh, um, directly affected and another uh, people just coming from abroad and uh, inventing in a specific scene. And however, multiple actors interacting, this needs um, for our understanding to deal and to work not only work together, but rather to develop a um, so solid understanding of the situation um, while communicating, interacting with all these different um, actors in the field. This leads us to our approach to uh, make use of multiple participatory methods, um, rather uh, coming or starting with um, I don't know, design thinking, for instance, urban laboratories, uh, uh, of course, all kind of qualitative approaches. We also make use of quantitative surveys and so on and so forth to get the whole, whole picture. And one major expertise I might stress that is uh, to um, support these actors, which we are working together in um, developing solutions that really fit and are tailored to the specific needs in the specific situation. Um, that um, leads us uh, oftenly into uh, cooperations also in, on an international level where we are kind of facilitators who just um, network, bring actors together with specific expertise. For instance, right now uh, to deal with the corona crisis um, where we have uh, international cooperation with Armenia, with uh, Iran, for instance, um, just bringing experts together uh, related to their respective questions, they, which are actually evolving within the crisis. Uh, of course, the crisis, as you all know and experience by yourself, is a very dynamic process. So actually nobody knew when we applied for the funding in the first stage, uh, what as major topics would be uh, later on. This is what we do. This is uh, my background, and uh, I'm very happy to contribute here in any sense, uh, wherever possible. Um, looking forward, of course, to meet physically also, um, wherever in Havana or in Berlin or uh, in any place in the world. And uh, with these words, I hand over to uh, Vicente, of course, my dear colleague. Thanks, Martin. No. Yeah, um, well, my name is Vicente Sandoval. I'm um, working as a postdoctoral visiting researcher at the Disaster Research Unit in the FU, Berlin. Um, and I collaborate most closely with uh, with the team that is preparing and advancing this, this um, international network for coll uh, um, collective intelligences. And basically, just to point out, a, a little thing to after to continue with with the presentation with the other partners is that uh, we are interested in, in 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 the case of Cuba um, because Cuba, like many many other um, well many countries around the world, but specifically in Latin America and the Caribbean and, and Chile, like the country I came from, uh, is is very exposed to different 
type of hazards like the hurricanes, also earthquakes and so on. And notoriously this uh, has several implications for the cities and especially to, to the Havana. So um, we want to, to, to engage in this conversation between uh, collective intelligence in the field of uh, buildings, constructions and urbanization and the field of disasters, crisis and 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 uh, well, and that basically. So that's that's it. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this project. I'm a professor from the Technological University of Havana, named it as Kuhai. Uh, this is the only technological university in Cuba, uh, and uh, there are around 13 uh, careers on engineering plus architecture. So uh, we have another four uh, um, studios of architecture in Cuba, another three, and uh, we are director in these uh, items, architecture and urbanism. In my case, I'm a senior professor in the faculty, but at the same time, I'm, the sh I'm sharing the advisory board of the uh, uh, undergraduate studies of architecture and urbanism and at the same time I'm researching in different things uh, uh, with the students and joining the academic uh, uh, tra training and research and the communication with communities and so on. I will talk a little bit more about it in, uh, tomorrow. And uh, so it's a great idea to involve the students uh, in this uh, collaboration. Uh, uh, first is a, another collaboration with uh, Fabrica de Arte, where uh, our colleague uh, Guyen works, and as well he works with us in the faculty. And uh, also it's uh, great because uh, the student can involve in the things that happen every day in the city and can, uh, can develop their uh, training, joining with the communities. And that is a, a, a main item in our education for more than 30 years or for more than 40 or 50 years in the in this uh, faculty so uh, we have also a lot of uh, contacts with engineers and uh, a lot of contact with another uh, faculties of other universities uh, universities of arts or design university in the university of havana then uh, this is another uh, important thing that involves the students in the what to do in the city, what to do about the city, and what to do about uh, uh, creating new knowledge for the life that is uh, our, our main target in the training of the faculty. So thank you again, everybody, for uh, hosting me in this uh, online environment and uh, looking forward to see what would be happening in the, in the project with the students with a collaboration between the three universities and with the other uh, participants uh, and their experiences in this uh, great collaboration. Thank you. Hello again. Um, now I'm going to talk about what is my my work in the Cuban Art Factory. The Cuban Art Factory is a, a cultural institution. It's a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary laboratory that is located in our factory of the very beginning of the 20th century. Our idea is put together all the art and 
The project was created now around more than seven years by the musicians X Alfon X Alfonso. Um, the idea of the project is how to create collaborations with all the different art and how to create connection with the different different um, artists in the city. That's great because the collaborations, the networking is part of the award today. Specifically, I'm the curator and specialist of the architecture and industrial design. And that's really great because we can create a different event and um, space to talk about the city today, about the design, about the architect, about the uh, environmental situations. And for this last year, we've been talking about that in our exhibitions, in our event and our workshop. We divided in our area our work in three parts. The first is exhibition, the second is lecture, and the third one is workshop. In lecture, we will be receiving so different artists from different parts of the world. And with workshop, we will be working well, with different universities in Cuba and um, abroad. That's really important because we believe in the idea that the students have to work and have to think about the cities we want. With the uh, Faculty of Architecture, as Professor Casanave said, it's been uh, working for the last, the last five years in create uh, opportunity and space for the student because uh, they can participate with us, not only like public, also like a uh, active member of our, our process. We are great because um, uh, Inteligencia Colectiva was born with us in Fabrica. We are part of this and we are be a great platform to show to all the Cuban our visitors what are we doing. Thank you very much. Well, um, good morning to, to everyone. Uh, good afternoon for those who are in, in Europe. I am uh, Jorge Peralta and I am the, uh, concert, the cultural attaché of the Spanish Embassy here in, in Havana. And here with me is um, Michel Tos, who is the cultural attaché of the Embassy of, of Germany. And just uh, brief words to, first of all, to welcome you uh, to this project. Uh, as you know, as you may know, um, this project is supported by at the European Union, and that's why, because we are we are here. Uh, these are European funds, which are channeled through UNIC, and, and we are the representatives of, of UNIC here in, in Havana. Uh, I think my colleague uh, Raquel may explain later the, uh, the project in which we are involved, the CLIC project. But uh, for now, the idea, I mean, my idea is to just to, uh, to explain very shortly why it's important for us this this project, what you're doing and what you're going to do in the next hours, days. Um, we're trying to promote uh, European, Cuba, the European-Cuban dialogue. Uh, and this screen is just a good show, I mean, a good, a good picture of, of this uh, open dialogue, even in times of, of COVID when things are more difficult. And, and, and also we, we would like to have uh, I mean, to, to we see this as an open and very, let's say, undisciplined dialogue. I mean, we want you to to think um, in a in a very creative, uh, free uh, way. So I think that this idea of, of course, inteligencias colectivas, even the name of that, and so has the name of of thinking collectively and thinking from the from the bottom. It's, it's something which, of course, is is relevant for us. So uh, I would invite you to, to of course, uh, think in this way, uh, trying to achieve some results. But I think that the, the important of this kind of, of processes is, is specifically the process thinking together, and and, and of course um, taking into account and, and bearing in mind the the, the context of of Cuba of, of Havana, which is a, an amazing and very special city, as many of you may, may know. So um, basically from our side, I don't know if uh, Michelle wants to, to add something. From our side, uh, we, we encourage you to, to have, as we say, fruitful, but not, not so fruitful <laughs> discussions in the, in the coming hours. And, and I hope everything will be, will be fine. Michelle? 
Hello, good morning or good afternoon to all of you. We are very proud to participate in this um, project, um, which is uh, a real uh, Cuban European one. I think there, or we think that there is an urgent need today to reconnect the artistic and creative community of Cuba with the world after 60 years of embargo and an overkill during the last months of um, Corona combined with new sanctions imposed by the Trump administration. So we are very thrilled to know more about your project and we want to support it as uh, soon and uh, as possible and with our our um, all our um, resources of course so good luck and uh, yeah we are looking forward to meet you uh, maybe soon uh, in real um, hello everyone I think you can you can hear me now hopefully you can uh, well, first of all, um, I'm Juanito. I am going to be representing Zoo House, the um, uh, group that has been developing Inteligencias Colectivas project for uh, 10 years now. I wanted to, first of all, say, like, uh, be thankful, say thank you to all the institutions uh, that have uh, made possible that we are here today. This seems like a gathering of uh, people, but uh, there's there has been a lot of work work pushed forward to be able to get together and to try and uh, start this phase two of Inteligencias Colectivas uh, Cuba. So I think uh, that on behalf of Zoo House, we can say that we are really happy also because we are working with the partners that just uh, presented themselves. Uh, so we are, think that we are really lucky to be here and that uh, one cannot um, except be a bit emotional when uh, these things come into fruition in the in the way that this is starting to to become. I think um, as uh, Lorenzo and, and Juan Chacon, my other partners from Zoo House will explain tomorrow and as uh, Lorenzo was explaining briefly, Cuba has always been of uh, a lot of interest for Inteligencias Colectivas, as you will see as I present the project in the following uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, I think you will understand and if not, uh, you can hopefully uh, ask some questions in the YouTube chat or in the uh, Google Meets chat and we will hopefully be able to answer them um, later. I think um, I, I agree and I'm really hopeful of what uh, Professor Jacob Bandris was saying that this is the beginning or the continuation of a project that uh, is going to be for, a, for the long term, so to speak, because we think it has a huge potential. And that was something I, I was thinking and that we in Zoo House have been talking about a, a lot during this past year. This is uh, something that we really want to engage with and that is something that we want to be connected with for the, the next couple or uh, years at least. So I think this is something that we all uh, think of as a collective. And as uh, Jorge Peralta was saying, uh, this thinking in a free way, thinking differently is what we're gonna try and present with uh, the project that we're about to show. I'm going to try and share a screen now. Hopefully uh, this works. Let me check. Okay, screen number one, now this is screen number two. Okay. One second. Is it working? I don't know if it's working. Now, no. So, Zoo House, I, I wanted to start there.
really important for people they live in a social, economical, and political way. First of all, we have a catalog. This catalog is, you might be thinking, what does Inteligencias Colectivas look for in order to uh, something to be a part of this catalog? This is what we call the catalog of Inteligencias Colectivas. I, I would recommend you to think about the sustainable development goals through the examples uh, we're going to share with you of Inteligencias Colectivas throughout this uh, presentation, throughout this lecture. Inteligencias colectivas, inteligencias colectivas, we look for spontaneous construction details and expected solutions that mix popular technologies with the imagination of the person that builds it. So in, our, in one of our trips in Colombia, we found this example. This person in Medellin wanted to sell CDs. So he thought uh, probably the best thing that could happen is that I get a hi-fi and put my CD so people know I'm selling CDs, but that would drain the battery of um, like nearly every week. So what this person thought that he could do was to design and construct a plug in the sidewalk, as you can see in this example, so he can put his hi-fi and uh, not have to use batteries uh, every week. The interesting thing in this design is that uh, he, you, you can look at the detail, it's super precise and super sophisticated, and it's perfectly camouflaged. So this is one of the things that Inteligencias Colectivas looks when trying to create a catalog of these uh, 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 urban uh, and architecture solutions. We look for everyday objects, common architectures and urban situations that apparently are insignificant. We want to see them from a new perspective. We want to give them a new value. This example, for instance, is a, a weighing machine. This guy put in Medellin, Colombia also. Um, normally, if I had a live audience, I would ask them, how many of you have a weighing machine at home? So some, some people would raise their hand and so on, and I would ask those, those people, how many times would you, do you use it a month? And for how long? So sometimes people would say, well, I use it once a week or once every two days. And the weighing is actually like 30 seconds. So it's interesting that I ha have this uh, thought that, that does, it, does it make sense that you own one if you use it for 30 seconds every week? So this man created a new job. So he's renting his weighing machine in a street, in a square, in Medellin, and of course, this can be uh, kind of problematic because people can say, well, he is doing this because, he, because maybe he can't do some other thing and so on, but that isn't the interesting thing in this example, we think. What is interesting here is that he has equipped the city with a feature which is much more sustainable than owing a weighing machine per household. Plus it creates a, like a really interesting uh, landscape. So now, there's this situation in the street where people can interact between each other and can say, hey, let's weigh each other out and so on. So there, you can go through the, the urban landscape and uh, develop new relationships. We look for actions that work without prejudice with the immediate, with what is at hand. So for instance, I don't know if you're gonna see this, but this is an example we also found in uh, Colombia, this time in Santo Domingo Savi. You can see that they have built um, this uh, sort of water park, park, so to speak. And what is interesting about this example is that we tend to think that roads are only built for cars, but uh, we've seen parades, uh, races, cyclist races, running races, and so on. And those are interesting ways of using uh, public infrastructure. That is, that is built specifically for a purpose, that is cars or buses or motorbikes and so on to go to from one place to another. But did you know that if you have a hill and you have access to water, you can actually build a water park? We look for tools that enable new dynamics and inventions that the alternative, the, and the alternative use of materials. 
Here is an example, for instance, is uh, uh, an example by the Dutch inventor Theo Janssen. Maybe some of you know him because of this invention, the Strandbest, the beach piece, as you can see in the right side of the image. If you don't know about them, the good thing of being online is that you can Google uh, Theo Janssen Strandbest on Google right now, and you can see examples of uh, what we're talking about. And what is interesting about this, besides the invention of the, the strand base, that obviously are uh, a pretty amazing invention, they can walk in the beach uh, because of the wind. What is interesting also is that he created tools to be able to develop this. So tools are something that we're really interested in because they enable people to do other things. So for instance, he's been using uh, this uh, tubes that they use in, in Net the Netherlands to, to put cable uh, underneath the ground. They no longer use this, um, these tubes and he was able to buy a big batch of these tubes and now he's created these tools so he's, uh, he can build this, this strand vest. We look for designs using alternative energy sources. One of the best examples of this are in San Andreas Itzapa in Guatemala uh, by a collective called uh, Maya Pedal. You can also check them online. They have this amazing collection of uh, machines that are powered through bicycle type uh, machinery. So this is a washing machine that you can wash your clothes while you pedal, but you can make a, like a, a juice or you can use any other thing that is able to be motorized by someone uh, doing a pedal function. So it's really interesting how they develop all these machines called Biti Machinas. You can check them out, uh, Biti Machinas by Maya Pedal. And we're really interested in how people are using alternative ways of energy to create different machines. We look for the transformation of everyday objects to give them superpowers. This example, for instance, the amphibious bicycle in Wuhan, China, you can see you can go and ride your normal bike, plus you have this like security area you, you get from uh, this uh, plastic bottles. Plus if you can encounter, so for instance, if you're traveling and you encounter a lake, you can go straight ahead so you, you can uh, use this situation where you put the bottles in this position and you can you don't have to go through the long way you can rather go across the lake and so on so these are inventions that give everyday objects a superpower we look for things that understand very well the particular conditions of their environment and they use the, the those conditions to their advantage this example of uh, Panye Football Club in Kopanye in Thailand is one of these examples. They used old canoes to build this platform in order to create a team. And so they, they could train and participate in the regional uh, tournaments and so on. They didn't have um, a football field because they live in this floating city, floating neighborhood and they decided that that wasn't something that would not uh, give a, an opportunity for them to be able to play football. At, so they decided to build this football pitch that is floating. We look for hybrids of the history of technique, objects, details, architectures that contain pieces, technologies, and materials from different historical moments. This example, for instance, we encountered in Lagos in Nigeria is a very interesting boat that is powered through a sail that is done with what are ba big bags of, of rice that are sewn together to create this sail. So what is interesting for us is that they, they are using this a traditional way of building boats, but they have implemented this recycling, so to speak, of this rice bags in order to create one of the most beautiful sales that I at least have ever seen. And it seems to be working for them. So it's really interesting to understand how 
people are starting to create innovation when um, that sometimes is better than what you can actually purchase in some different places and so on. We look at half-breed situation objects and architectures that mix materials with different origins and natures. This is an example in Palomino in Colombia, where you can see this rocking chair that is knitted in with the, this traditional material, but that the upper part where you lay your back is knitted in a different material. This material is plastic, pet plastic from a seven up bottle. They created a tool, as I was saying before with the Theo Janssen example, they created a tool so they could get pet this really, really tiny uh, pet strings out of a seven up bottle and so they could use it as a string so they can't access this material because they live in this specific place and so they decide to create an innovation, they create a tool and they use a thing that is readily available like a seven up bottle that as you may know is widely available throughout the globe that is one thing that globalization has done is that you can buy Coca-Cola or 7-Up in the most remote part in the world and they are using this material in order to repair chairs like this one. We look for covers. Variables, declinations of the same material, technology or situation that have been evolved or modified to be applied to a different contemporary situation. So say for instance this one. This example you can see in the right is in Constitución, Chile. Uh, in 2009, they had a very big earthquake and lo a lot of people lost their homes and the Chilean government gives every family what they call a media agua. Media agua is a wooden structure that has this, this shape. What is interesting is that people customize their media aguas in many different ways. I haven't, we haven't brought all the examples, of course, but uh, one of the examples that is uh, more interesting and that I think illustrates this point about covers is this example. As you can see, they have opened this windows above to create a situation where they have more light inside because they thought, well, this media agua is, is fine, is okay, but I want more light. So this is one of the multiple examples of customizing media agua you can find throughout Chile after a, a natural disaster like a, an earthquake. What, what, what we thought was interesting is that this was uh, what we, we said before, or what I mentioned before about this situation where there's this cover situation, and is that they created something that emulates this situation you can find in the Pantheon in Rome. So that is something we also find is really interesting that people are creating situations that um, are similar to uh, what we would con consider one of the most amazing architect architectural situations in history. Ever evolving objects, ever changing architectures that learn from the city and change to adapt to contemporary situations. We look for resilient architecture. So as you can see, this is another example in Palomino in Colombia. You can see they use these tires for cars and when the tires of the cars are not useful anymore, they make these shoes. Guajira is the area in Colombia where Palomino is situated in the north near uh, Venezuela. And as you can see, they are reusing this, the tires to make the soles of the, these shoes. When the shoes don't uh, work anymore, they will use this in order to when, open and close the door. So it's interesting how they are reusing this material in, in different shapes to be able to create different um, like objects that are of use in different uh, situations. We look for elements that imply an oral tradition, technologies that have been transmitted from generation to generation. We look for designs that maybe don't need drawings to be fabricated. 
This example in Karachi, in Pakistan, is one of, of the buses you can find throughout Pakistan and India. They are customized in many different ways, and they are talking about something that we think is also really valuable in Inteligencias Colectivas, and it's this sense of identity. So they are creating a bus that is unique, that is a bus that has to do with the person that is driving the bus, or that has designed the bus, or that has co-designed that bus. So what we think is really amazing is that they are translating this aesthetics in a sense that they are giving or trying to portray something that is special through design. So this bus is different to any other bus. And maybe there's people that are uh, more into one type of bus because its aesthetic is one, and one might be interested in another bus because the aesthetic is different. And we think that is interesting because it creates a sense of uh, something that you, you, you think you can design on. And that is something we will uh, talk about in, in a few minutes when we talk about the second, the, one of the subsequent phases of the methodology of inteligencias. We look for urban situations, management strategies that require negotiation between agents for its design, production, and future use. This example we call Parterre Commons in Berlin, in Germany, is really interesting that these uh, situations where there's a tree and there's uh, vegetation, there's different uh, people that take care of them. So the city council has decided that they will leave people to take care of them and they, as it, that happened in, in the bus and many examples we already showed, that people take ownership of those city areas. And we think that is really important that people start to understand that the city is also theirs. And there's an interesting uh, thing happening in this example, as many of you may know, because probably there's a lot of people uh, listening from Berlin, is that they create different um, designs. So if you own a bookshop, maybe you do the benches with books and you put books so people can read. If you own a bar, maybe you can open some uh, holes in the bench so you can put a glass and so on. So it's really interesting how these uh, common uh, areas of vegetation throughout the city are customized in different ways and are designed, taking into account who is taking care of them and so on. And we think those kind of designs are really interesting because they open, as I said, like a, a, a door to people to take ownership of their city and to be involved with the, the design of it. We look for small fragments of reality that describe multiple social, economic, and political layers. This example, for instance, the floor that paid the bills is an example in uh, Calle Capon in the Chinese neighborhood in Lima, in Peru. The city council doesn't pay for the, um, the trash collection. So they decided this association, uh, Peruvian Chinese association, decided they were going to sell pieces of floor that you could customize. So you could put any message and pay $30 and they would put it there. So you could uh, tell someone you love them. You could uh, tell someone you remember their birthday, someone, some, someone has born or whatever, and you could pay $30 and with that money, they will pay the trash uh, recollection and the lights. So this is an urban strategy that, that this association took ownership of their street and decided to create this innovative situation that paid the bills that the city council wasn't able to pay for. And we look for situations where there is a horizontal hierarchy of technology, ob objects, architectures, where structure, installation, ornament, details, finishings, aesthetics, etc., have an equivalent importance. This example we found in a hardware uh, store, not in Lima, Peru. I'm sorry, this is in uh, Chile. 
And normally when you will go to a hardware store and you have to uh, buy some cable, normally they will unfold the cable, like the, the giant uh, uh, like cable they have there, and they will count one meter, two meters, three meters, and so on. And then they will like give it to you but what was interesting here is that this this person in in Chile created this design that was able to count cable and uh, lace it up at this at the same time. So this is um, something you use for our ironing. These are the metal things in the in cars. This is to count the amount of light you consume in a household. So they created this the whole new design to be able to create to the client. One thing we we tend to do is, so these all of these were examples. I can't go to the beginning that go and then fit into the catalog. These are the kind of things we look for and that we. Um, name inteligencias colectivas. I think it's a broad uh, am amount of examples, so it can trigger your imagination. If you're really curious, you can go to inteligenciascolectivas.org and spend some time navigating and um, seeing many more of these kind of uh, designs we have we have been interested in and that we wanted to share with you as a way of looking at the urban context at the cities we we live in. These examples, this catalog is uh, something that we use to think, to think with others. Inteligencias Colectivas is about shifting the way we think about design. The usefulness and beauty of a design depends on our vision of the world and the context in which our daily life unfolds, of the paradigms through which we act and through which we know why objects are the way they appear to be. As you can see, this design we call Cuanto Cable Quiete, it not only has a drawing in, in inteligenciascolectivas.org, but it has like an instruction manual where you can see how it's built. For us, the interesting thing about thinking about these objects, because when you draw something, you think about it, and that is the power of drawing, is that uh, the what we're concerned is not that other people necessarily can copy these designs as they are uploaded in the website with a, a Creative Commons stamp here, as you can download the the DWG files and you can draw on top and do uh, upgrades and so on. What we're interested in here is that you get to understand how design works. So for us, design normally works as a black box. So say, for instance, if you have a smartphone, probably you have a smartphone in your pocket. That is what we call a black box. You don't know how it works in the inside. And if it gets broken, you open it and you don't understand anything and you can't fix it. So you have to send it somewhere. So they fix it and they give it to you back. And the next time it gets broken, the same thing occurs. What is interesting for us about open source design, and that is something we're really into when we do these kind of things, is that people understand how things work so they can interact with them, they can better them, they can do things on top of them. So we draw them so people in other places can understand how design works and that they can be inspired to get something and build build something if they need it, they can get a design. We have done these drawings, what we call upgrade drawings, and they can understand how they work so they can do stuff the same way, but with the materials they can find in their own uh, city or town or whatever, and so on. So that is the way we think about design. We think about design with other people, we do drawings, and we present them with how things work. These are some examples of uh, these upgrades I was talking about. You can see here uh, what we call a tetracleta. It's a bicycle with four wheels 
but two of the wheels are behind so you can have a platform so you can uh, travel and take things that are bigger. So this is a design you can understand that you can implement in your life if you want to, that you can also upgrade. So you can do a transformation of, the, of this design and test it, text it back. Uh, uh, you can register in the website and you can upload it as an upgrade of this design. Cuanto cable quiere, the same thing works with this lamppost or this bench that is made with two normal chairs and some wood. This is a design you can find many of them throughout the world and they are normally done with the structures that you can find in those different places. So it's something you can understand. Two, two chairs separate with something in the middle makes a bench. So now there's three people that can sit. Well, now with this COVID thing, maybe it's not the best time to, to share this design, but uh, hopefully um, uh, things get better and this still makes sense because this is a really interesting design that makes something, uh, as I was saying before, a superpower. We also co-design and co-build. What do we mean by this? Inteligencias Colectivas does not look at this emergent heritage as if it was something to remain untouched or preserved statically. This emergent heritage is the foundation for new designs that can be evolved through prototypes in different ways. So all these things we collect in this catalog that is available for everyone online, which has their own description, characteristics, where it's found, you can go and talk to the person who um, invented this thing so you can expand on the information and, and put it on the website, so it's a collective construction of this catalog where we co-think, we think about them, we make drawings, we try and modify them and make them better and so on. In these places where we've developed different projects as we're doing now in Cuba, in, you, you've seen the map uh, we were showing at the beginning with all of these places. It's places where we've been and we've developed uh, different prototypes. We go there, we do these uh, saf safaris, so to speak, and we uh, collect inteligencias and we work with local institutions and with local people to create prototypes. We, as Zoo House, have our know-how. So we uh, have been developing uh, design for a number of years. And when we encounter other people, we share our knowledge and those people share their knowledge with us. And that is how we co-design and co-build these prototypes. These prototypes are designed by understanding all those inteligencias colectivas that you can find in the catalog and trying to create an evolution from the perspective of what I was saying we look for. So we look for hybrids. So if it's what we have is not a hybrid, maybe we'll try and do a hybrid. If it's something that isn't using things that are local, maybe we'll try and uh, do that, that inteligencia colectiva through local materials and so on. So all of the, those things we were mentioning at the beginning of what we look for is after one in the phase of prototyping, one of uh, what the tools we use in order to think and design these prototypes. So some of them, I'm going to show, and this one is in uh, Equatorial Guinea. These ones are in Palomino. As you can see, each of them are using different um, materials. So for instance, the wood we could find in Equatorial Guinea was amazing. So we decided to use, of course, the wood. Uh, in, in, in Palomino, in Colombia, we had available all this material of palm trees and they used to use it for making uh, this roofing system. Not nowadays, they started using uh, zinc as we use or as a, a material that they thought was better because it came from the West. 
And it was interesting that we started their conversation with them, understanding that this palm material that they used to use before they started using zinc, what made much more sense because um, of the different architect, act, act, architectural properties it gave, not only the space, but as a, a functional um, material and so on. And it was interesting that we designed with them these different shapes. They call this la maloca loca, that is the crazy maloca. Maloca is like a roofing, so that would be like the crazy roofing because we designed with them that obeyed to uh, geometry, they, they, it was new for them. And since we had studied this uh, and we had this knowledge of creating uh, these geometric shapes, we shared with them this idea of creating this shape so we wouldn't have to cut the tree. So uh, we used this geometry to sort out the tree and they discovered that they were able to create these different shapes with the material they had been using for years and that they no longer used. This zinc material was better because that is what uh, we used all west. So that was a really interesting uh, experience also. We also do the drawings, of course, of the designs of the prototypes we do, because of course, if we do them with the intelligencias, we have to share how things are built. And we, this is only one of the drawings. There, there's like six or seven drawings in this design that was built in Lima, in Peru. It's called Inca Cycle. It's a bicycle that is used to create uh, like, like a sign, a signage for this uh, lab called Esquilab. It's like a media lab they have in Lima. And it's built, uh, powered by a bicycle. And you can see it at night and you can identify where Esquilab is because uh, when we arrived there, there wasn't a sign. Nobody knew where Esquilab was when we were meeting people at Esquilab. So it was very easy because we identified, okay, so first of all, we should do a sign so people know where Esquilab is so we can meet them to create projects. So uh, in the end, this was our final prototype there and it was using different bottles, recycled bottles from uh, Inca Cola, one of the um, very famous drinks there. And we were using recycled bottles because there's a huge network of people that in parallel to the council are collecting uh, waste and taking it to uh, recycle and so on. And we collaborated with, with one of these collectives to get this bottle to design this prototype. These are the last two prototypes we, we have developed, one in Manila, the one in the left, and one in Karachi in Pakistan, the one of the, on the right. I'm going to go in uh, more depth in this prototype we designed in Madrid. This would be around the year 2012. It's a bit old now, but I think it still is useful to understand the way Inteligencias Colectivas works uh, when it's co-designing and co-building these prototypes. So this is called La Oficina, the, the office, so to speak. Uh, and it was situated in, uh, inside an art, um, art institution called Matadero in Madrid. And what was interesting is that they, they wanted to do an exhibition on Inteligencias Colectivas. And we said, our exhibition is not uh, the catalog or whatnot, because you can see that online. The exhibition would be a prototype done by translating the some of the inteligencias we have online so people can live in real life what uh, an innovative solution is that is something that has to do with those inteligencias colectivas that we had been collecting the previous uh, two and a half years. So this is the oficina, as you can see in this drawing, these uh, words you can see here, I'm sorry, they're in Spanish, estructura evolutiva, rotulo luminoso, parking de bicis, fachada de lavadoras, eh, carril técnico, and so on, are all 
designs that evolve from a previous Inteligencia that we had already searched. So I don't know, this uh, meat is making noises. I don't know if I have to, uh... oh, it's okay. Right. So um, I'm sorry, I got distracted because of the Google Meets. Um, so as you can see in, in this picture, you can, you can more or less imagine what the process of working, designing this uh, office was like. So I'm sorry, now this is working. No, didn't. So these are some of the details we wanted to show you. So for instance, we made a bicycle that created energy. So we were able to uh, create the, like the electricity of the office. So the whole office was powered by a bicycle. So when the energy ran, either someone started pedaling or we had to stop working. So that was the idea. So in the end, you have an understanding of how much energy you're uh, consuming. Now you, you enter a house or is and you press a button and it, it goes on like nearly magically. And for us, it's really interesting that you are able to see what what things uh, take to be made in this in this case the energy uh, estructura evolutiva evolving structure is something you can see throughout uh, Peru and also in Morocco where in different uh, places I've seen them in those two places where they leave part of the structure unfinished waiting for uh, them to either get more money or maybe their family grows and they have to build another floor and so on. So that stru uh, structure uh, was created through the influence of that Inteligencia. Of course, we didn't have to build more floors, but maybe we wanted to make it longer. So that is why we designed it this way and so on. So I'm not going to go into more detail, but I, as you can see, all the different designs were born by thinking of these different Inteligencias and making this kind of collage of evolving, translating inteligencias colectivas into a specific context like is Madrid. What is interesting also is not only the specific design of these details, which is, uh, in, of course, uh, really valuable, but the way the, the management of spaces goes. Uh, in this sense, the office was that we had to unbuild the office and we tried to maintain the office there, claiming that it could be used for other people. So we were only going to use this office for a period of time. That was the period of time this exhibition was ongoing where we had built the oficina and uh, the, we created a campaign that was called Save the Dinosaur because we imagined that this uh, Oficina was a dinosaur and that we didn't want it to be extinguished and uh, extinct. And uh, we designed this campaign. They let us move the dinosaur uh, to a better place inside the space and they started using it in different events. It was interesting that this event was a, a, a photo exhibition that had this standard white panels you can find in many exhibitions. And this school of photography decided that they wanted to use the oficina, the dinosaur. What was interesting is that when we interviewed them, they said, this space is much better than the white space that every other people has in this exhibition because people notice us through in this white space. And for us as a, a photography school is really interesting because they come and ask about the structure and as, as they're there, we tell them about the school. So they, they get uh, much more publicity because of the oficina was there. So imagine if we had unbuilt the oficina, they would have had this normal white space to uh, promote their school. What was interesting is that we were thinking about the buses in Pakistan and all these kinds of things that create 
a sort of identity inside what we would call normal design, so to speak. And it was interesting that they and, and many other people that were able to use the structure throughout the life of the dinosaur in Mataero Madri uh, told us that they were really interested in the structure because it was different than what was normally uh, there. Tragically, we had to unbuild the oficina, uh, but of course we weren't going to uh, throw it away. We put it in another place and decided to create this moment of hibernation. So the dinosaur went to uh, hibernate for a period of time until we designed, co-designed and co-built with the same wood that was uh, used for the oficina, we created this uh, greenhouse for a space that needed a green greenhouse to put some plants in, inside. What is interesting about this space is that it's all designed taking into account the material we had and also providing uh, what we thought was the most interesting solution for this greenhouse. As you can see here, we had to unbuild it again uh, because they had to move from one place to another. What is interesting is that finally we moved it to this other uh, place where now it is living as a greenhouse that serves to this uh, collective that uh, is part of the network of orchard, urban orchards in uh, Madrid. Also what is really important for us is what we call uh, co-commons. That would be understanding that all these designs are part of something that is bigger than the, the scale of what we're trying to communicate. There's many ways of looking at the city, new uh, maps and so on, that understand city in a specific way, in a specific scale. Inteligencias Colectivas is a, a tool, a way of seeing, a way of understanding cities that are, have their ways of understanding uh, materials and building and things that are important that have been a part of their identity throughout the years and so on, and that have to do with what is happening there. So Inteligencias Colectivas are not isolated objects or situations. They are a manifestation of how cities are built and how people live. This is a map called Lagos Urban Commons we did for an exhibition uh, many years, like four or five years ago, where we tried to create one of the first maps of Lagos. Lagos is uh, one of the cities in the world that has developed an exponential growth uh, that, that has been like super big throughout the last uh, 60 to 70 years now. And what is interesting is that they, like 90% of Lagos is informal. What does that mean? That the city council sends an urban planner to a place and they decide to create um, uh, a new urban situation there and they, they go back to their offices and they start to draw and so on and then they go back to do some other measurements and people have already settled there. So it's growing at a very, very fast pace and in a very informal way. So having maps is really difficult. So we created this map that understood the city in a different way. It understood it taking into account um, inteligencias, but in a broad sense. So this material and technologies, but also the different guilds and uh, where people work in a traditional way. So different situations that we thought were part of what Inteligencias Colectivas is inside the city. Not so much how the uh, urban environment is displaced, is, is placed in a, a, a specific way, but rather where you can encounter these different situations that have to do with how the city and how the people are actually living uh, as I was saying uh, before. What is also really important, and I'm nearly finishing now, is 
this situation of co-owned ownership. For us, it's really important to understand that who owns the city is the people who participate actively in the creation of design in the city. Inteligencias Colectivas is about sharing, sharing knowledge and sharing responsibility between the human network of the project. We always work with other people that are from those places and that give us that knowledge that we don't have. And we try to work with them, understanding that they have a very, very important know-how. And that is something that we are going to be uh, listening in this uh, symposium that is going to be done, well, the, the uh, second uh, day tomorrow, but also there's going to be uh, session number two in January, session number three in uh, February, that we're going to start to listen uh, to people that actually live there, that understand how things work and that can inform the way we design and that we can start designing with them the things that really uh, in the scale that people really uh, live the city. One of the people that is going to be part of the human network, of course, is all of the people that are actually listening in the Google Meets, but also in the YouTube, the people that are studying in the seminar at TU and at Kuha and so on. And I want to present you now, this is a bit of a spoiler, that, but I wanted to share with, or we thought it was interesting to share it with you as something that we can give you as homework for uh, tomorrow. I, I, we would recommend everyone that, well, this person is called Ernesto Oroza. He's a designer from Cuba. He's been doing design and he's really interesting because he, he has been working in many of the topics that uh, Inteligencias Colectivas is interested in and hopefully we'll be able to talk to Ernesto in future sessions. There's two videos uh, we wanted to share. Uh, first, first one is this one. Maybe I can share it. I don't know how to share it. You uh, can count on this. I, I will share the videos in the, in the chat now. And you can see these two videos for tomorrow because I think they will be a, a, a good starting point for day number two, which will be uh, like explained or presented at the beginning by uh, my partner Juan Chacon and then uh, Lorenzo that you got to meet at the beginning of the session will explain more about what we did in phase number one of Inteligencias Colectivas Cuba. We are really interesting to present a bit of the reality that Inteligencias Colectivas is interested about the reality in Cuba. And I think with this, I can finish the presentation and now we can open the conversation to uh, other people. I don't know if there's questions. I think Cristina and Guyen maybe have collected some questions. Maybe can, uh, we can have this open conversation between each other. Um, thank you. I'm going to try and share this now. Thanks, Juanito, for the presentation. So I want to invite Cristina, who is with us, uh, and she's going to help me here with, uh, with the discussions we are having right now. Cristina, are you here? Cristina, do you hear me? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Juanito, for this uh, amazing presentation. Um, I will be hosting with Nguyen uh, the, the, this discussion. Um, so if you have any questions um, for Juanito, I, I, I have some questions, but I would like to ask you first, any person of our group? <laughs> Okay, Cristina, I have uh, two questions. Professor Casanave from Kuhai, 
Um, so well, I wanna... um, I would love uh, seeing this uh, this presentation um, uh, of Intelligences Colectivas um, talking about uh, not only uh, talking about different topics about sustainability. Um, about uh, commoning, about valuing all this diverse knowledge coming from from the local communities. Um, I would like to, to somehow it comes to my mind bringing uh, this, uh, all these institutions together today and mostly academic institutions. I would like to, to ask um, our three uh, uh, institutions uh, our three professors today, Professor Jacob Brees, Professor Martin Vo, uh, Vos, and Professor uh, Joycelyn uh, Casanova. Um, of what do you think about uh, current educational institutions like including forms and formats uh, that, that don't exist within uh, our established education, uh, that they are based on local and situated knowledge uh, like uh, Juanito was uh, showing. Shall I start? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so for me, it's uh, really uh, useful. I mean, um, when we we give so the 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 knowledge has changed over the years, and the way to to teach students and to take a profession, uh, it's uh, it's changing as well. Then this means you have to involve the students in the normal life in order to understand what is happening and what what the people need in the normal life in the different urban situations in different areas in the different different local communities that need not only the prof a profession from the academic view but the the tools and the abilities in general to deal with the with the um, normal life with the um, yeah, with the life in general, and then to fit the needs that people uh, are demanding every day. So our profession mostly focused sometimes in the in the in doing things for people that have money, and how to do it for people that don't have any money to do it, and any resource to, to develop to develop then you you have to think on how to connect this the these professions from the moment they are students in order to understand this and in our context this is very very important because we we give a very uh, high level of importance to this what is happening in the communities and what we need to uh, that our students learn to do something afterwards in the community. Then I think this kind of uh, collective knowledge, I could, I would say, is really important from the beginning in order to, to understand from the very beginning when you enter in a community, what is needed, what is uh, the resource there, what is the valuable that you can use with, with your technological Ability that general. <laughs> Thank you. And Professor Dr. Martin Voss. Yes, and can I can of course completely agree um, about the need of such capacity or competences to um, teach students also um, how to deal with everyday life problems. So I'm completely uh, with you, as I understood you correctly. Um, on the other hand, um, I think uh, going into practice uh, is really a very challenging endeavor. So the 
challenge that I see is how to teach them regular uh, modes of academic working on the one hand, and also additionally the competences to deal with the practical needs. Um, from, from on, based on my profession, on my, my background of, of experiences, um, one shall really not underestimate how difficult this, this is in practice. Uh, even highly professionals who are very trained in their um, domains uh, have huge uh, crucial problems if then they uh, um, move beyond the border or the, the um, yeah, if they if they switch from practice into theory or academics or the, which are rather so usually you are trained to go into one role uh, but not really good in doing both uh, usually if people are able to do so they are um, old already <laughs> so it takes time to learn all these different capacities or to gain them thank you um i will repeat the question again for professor jacob varis um uh, i was um questioning before what is uh what is your thought about uh, education including format forms and formats uh, that they don't exist within our current institutions uh, that are mostly based in in local situated knowledges and and local communities yeah i got half of the questions so thanks for repeating <laughs> and uh, but i think uh, i enjoyed the lecture and i think it's an example of uh, inventiveness eh? And I think it's many of these things, people, uh, it's just looking, making people aware eh, that you could see them and discover these inventions. So, for instance, this shoe uh, from the tire and becomes a kind of fixation for a wall, or it is also looking and discovering them. So it's training the eye and training the mind to, um, yeah, to, yeah, to sort of be aware of these uh, inventions and try to use them and absorb them. And um, so I, that, that, that's interesting to, to see. So I think it's dealing with this inventiveness that can be an interesting lesson for everybody, not only students. And uh, so this is an interesting exercise for for every, everybody involved in the, in, in, in the project. So I think uh, the house story and the is a method but it's also an interesting learning tool that is not linked to let's say um, one scale or one country so that can be done anywhere so and but it's also about training um, yeah training the minds to to discover them so maybe many people will not will never discover them because they were not aware of this they don't stand them make themselves open to, um, to discover them. So this, I think, is uh, something that is, it, it, it can be trained, I think, people can be. And by, I think for students, it can be a very valuable exercise to, that they can benefit from in a later stage in their career. And I think also it's interesting, this kind of uh, integration between this uh, academic or scientific knowledge mm -hmm. that uh, we are trained <laughs> to get and the local, let's say, uh, situated knowledge that you find in yeah. different places. For for some people in Cuba, some things are very normal, and then others that are not from there uh, might find them very interesting and look at them from a different perspective. So that I think that of course the exchange of the different cultures and, 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 and countries. So um, that's um, let's see what comes out of it. But I think this is uh, quite promising. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have a question from um, a Cuban student, actually, that Nguyen can address it. Nguyen, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. So I have a question for, from a Cuban student. It's for IC members, uh, she want to know more specific about the method that you use to find and relate these different exercises. If you have a specific methodology or you or you use also intuitions, intuition for us, for that. Juanito, you can start. Hello. Um, 
I, I don't know if I don't know if maybe Juan Chacón, do you want to answer this question? Uh, hello. Uh, I prefer you to to answer it, Juanita, if you can. Okay. Thank you. So so to answer the question, I, I wanted to to refer briefly to what Professor Jacob Andres was saying. And th that is totally the point. So sometimes we we talk about the inteligencias colectivas glasses in the sense that when you go through this uh, methodology or how you want to call it, you end up seeing the world in a different way. So you end up with these new glasses where you're able to spot these um, uh, inteligencias colectivas, no? this uh, collective knowledge, as uh, uh, Professor Joyce Helen Casanave was was saying. And I think if 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 you you said those uh, words, I think we totally uh, synced because that is what we were trying to portray in the presentation. So uh, at least a bit successful, I think uh, the the presentation was so. So I'm happy that, that you said that. Thank you. Thank you very much. To answer the question of, of Kuhae that Guyen was was asking, it's it's a it's a dynamic process. So it's not a specific way of doing things. The questions or the the, the ways that we were speaking about during the presentation the ways we look so we presented like 10 12 ways we uh, look for things that specific way of looking has been built throughout the years so at the beginning maybe we started looking at three of those things because we didn't know that the other eight of them were part of what inteligencias colectivas might be interested in and the the things have been growing these ways of looking have been growing throughout the years and hopefully uh, Inteligencias Colectivas Cuba will bring new ways of looking to Inteligencias Colectivas. Uh, I'm convinced that that is going to happen. I, it's not something uh, that I have to wish for. I am convinced that that is going to happen. So in that sense, the beginning is to be familiar with those ways of looking that we were trying to share with you today this presentation and hopefully uh, another document where we can put these ways of looking can be in the Inteligencias Colectivas Cuba website available for everyone. We're currently uh, working on that to uh, make it available to everyone so we can have this open conversation of what might be Inteligencias Colectivas in Cuba and what might not be, uh, this is an open conversation. So it's not something that I can answer what is Inteligencias Colectivas in Cuba. That is something we have to build together. So there is an answer that we start, or I would start through these ways of looking that we already shared, but we are so open to other ways of looking uh, or other ways of trying to create a broader sense of what Inteligencias Colectivas is. And that is the what we think is one of the most interesting things or beauties of the project is that it's an ongoing growing thing and it depends on the people that are involved in the project. It's not what I say or what Juan Chacón says or what Lorenzo says. It's what we in an open conversation think that is collective knowledge in Cuba specifically throughout the following or the next months, hopefully next years. So I am sorry that I don't have a super concrete um, uh, answer to this, but it is because I am making that student co-responsible. So now that person know what Inteligencias Colectivas is, I am, we are uh, open to create a discussion with that person and with all the people that are attaining attending this uh, symposium today to create uh, what Inteligencias Colectivas Cuba is. Thank you so much, Juanito. Um, I think Professor Joycelyn 
Casanave uh, has also a question for you. Uh, I can address it or uh, you can address it, Zoisalen. So uh, I think he answered in a, in a way my question because uh, I was thinking that uh, maybe instead of, of uh, seeing what is happening in the street with the new innovations, we would say, we can, we can see with our prepared eyes uh, between, uh, yeah. uh, we can see what, what are the resources. And then if we can look at the resources, we can develop new answers using these resources in this, uh, in each situation in the city. And, the, and I think Havana could be a, a great environment for that. Even we can uh, divide it in the different local uh, realities and in the different uh, local uh, practices uh, uh, for doing things and for answers uh, question in the city. Uh, then it's, uh, I think, uh, fully answered in my opinion. Uh, 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 that be precise is very justice. On the contrary, uh, that makes, uh, that allows us to participate and to join ideas in order to make it better. And it's mm -hmm. a great uh, opportunity for us. And uh, my second question was around um, how to make it usable. Uh, because sometimes uh, the prototypes, when you draw them, they are not uh, fully understand, uh, understandable for everyone. Then how to do it um, shareable? How to, to connect the people in order to, to, to show in another ways or in, in a different ways in order to, to 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 get some people more people in the experience and to to communicate for to more people to more different people in general i don't know if i i, I could uh, understood well uh, um, explain me well i don't know so thank you for the opportunity yeah, you explained yourself uh, perfectly. I wanted to add briefly a uh, comment on the question I was answering before. I think Lorenzo tomorrow and Juan that will be commenting more on our uh, previous visit in Cuba will be able to answer the question better. I, I didn't want to sound uh, cryptic or the thing is being open sometimes leaves uh stuff unsolved but not because i don't want to solve it uh, it's because i don't want to sound that i know the answer right now i just wanted uh, to sound that uh, the process is open and that is going to grow through the uh, input of the different agents that are part of the project but we have already been in cuba we've uh, uh made with guyen we have traveled around uh, and we've seen many things that we think are already interesting. And uh, Juan Chacon and uh, Lorenzo specifically will uh, speak about those things that caught our eyes, caught uh, the, the way we look at the, during our first trip there. And we will share with them, uh, we will share them with you tomorrow. And hopefully we will have an open conversation on those things specifically as a second step in this process. So this was a presentation of more of um, not an abstract uh, presentation of the way we look because we tried to put concrete examples so people got to know exactly what we mean by we look for spontaneous construction details and expected solutions, blah, blah, blah. But uh, tomorrow we will uh, develop more the idea of what things caught our eye uh, from Cuba in our first trip there. But as I said, it's open and it's been developed through the, through the month. So when we were there, we were interested in some specific things 
And we, when we came back here, we started thinking about things and suddenly it was like, oh, we should also think about these things because we think it's interesting. We should ask Guyen or now we will ask Joyce Seleno, or maybe some of your students and so on. So it's something that is being built by the second, you know, it's something that is super present now and we don't have an, an example uh, definitive answer because it's been built, so to speak. It's a, a process. And regarding your question, I think the 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 fact that you're you're asking that question is wonderful because that is something that normally maybe that no, it's not a question that we think about, and it's something that is really important. Uh, Again, I, I and I think we don't have a concrete uh, answer to that, but we have the intention that that happens. And as we, as we normally say, like we're going to make that be a factor in the process. So if Joycelyn Casanave thinks it's important that we take into account other voices and other people and that we make our designs uh, more transparent, more understandable, more relatable, more those things. I says that we need to take when we start co-designing. So uh, I can't agree more with with what you're saying because it's it's a super interesting uh, idea you put uh, on the table or in this case in the 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 cloud or the interweb or whatever. Thank you so much, Juanito. Uh, I think Yuyen has one um, question, another question from a student, basically, from there in Cuba. Yuyen, can you hear me? Thanks, Christina. So yeah, I can hear you, thanks. So we want to finish with, with this question. How to maintain local and international network, networks? How to stay connected and continue building knowledge? It can be answered by Lorenzo, Juanito, Chacon. Sorry, Julian, can you repeat the, the first part of the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. How to maintain local and international networks how to stay connected and continue building knowledge? So it's a, an amazing question. Regarding the knowledge we're um, interested in specifically, inteligenciascolectivas.org, the idea of our platform is that it creates a place where people can share knowledge from all around the globe. So. Say, for instance, hopefully the students of Kuhai register in the website and can be active members of this place. It's the same as if we think of Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is a place where people share knowledge from many different places in a specific format, uh, in a specific way. It's true that there are some people that are part of a Wikipedia foundation that are act as editors or things like that that are trying to make that the website works for people to access, to read, and to get that knowledge. So that maybe would be the task of the people that are here. We are going to act as uh, people that who, uh, try to make that things are uh, you can communicate things in a, in a good way or that the pictures work, um, the format is the format that it should be and so on, but it's only technicalities. The knowledge is uh, created or is shared by the members of the website. So Inteligencias Colectivas is a platform, anyone can be from Inteligencias Colectivas and the question this student was asking is answered through this platform. So how do we share knowledge in different places? And uh, well, our idea, or that is why we created Inteligencias Colectivas. <laughs> Again, I don't know if I'm answering, but it's a perfect question because 
the question is supposed to be answered through the project we are talking about here today. And that student can be an active member of this platform. We only create the platform so people can share that knowledge. So thank you, Juanito. We are finishing the debate. I want to thank Cristina Serifi. We know we have some answer in YouTube, so I invite to uh, all the participants to, to give you that answer, uh, that question and answer later by YouTube. So um, we are finishing now our first day of our event, and I want to thank everyone who's been with us, uh, Cristina Serifi, Vicente Sandoval, Professor Dr. Martin Boss, uh, Juanito Jones, uh, Chagón, Ruben, Lorenzo, Lorena, Professor Jacobs, Professor Casanave. In a special way, we want to thank all the people who's been helping us with the connection. Peter Fisher from the TU, Guille uh, here in, in from Kuhari. So tomorrow we're gonna starting at the same time and we'll be having uh, a debate a panel with also to understand the, the Cuban situation. Thank you all and good evening for everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye. 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 <laughs> bye. See you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Bye bye.